with us and we'll turn now to our second talk, uh, second presentation by two speakers, Andrew Pedigree and Arthur Debatevin. And I will introduce them. They're going to be talking about the library of fragile history. Andrew Pedigree is professor of modern history at the University of St. Andrews and director of the Universal Short Title Catalog. Educated at Oxford, he's held a number of research fellowships and is the author of over a dozen books in the field of Reformation history and the history of communication. He's held visiting fellowships at All Souls College, Oxford and a number of other places and is a former vice president of the Royal Historical Society. Arthur Dubedevin is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the University of St. Andrews and deputy director of the Universal Short Title Catalog. He received his PhD from St. Andrews in 2018. He's interested in cultural and political history, especially the early modern period, 1500 to 1800. His research focuses on the history of news, books, libraries, communication, and politics. His current project is The Culture of Catastrophe, the Dutch Republic and the Legacy of the Disaster Year 1672 to 1748. It will explore the devastation of the Dutch Republic in the summer of 1672 when the country was simultaneously attacked by an international alliance of four states led by the King of France, Louis XIV. Gentlemen, over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Linda, for that, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, and may I just say what a, what a great honor it is to be here and to be able to address this conference. Uh, we're very grateful, uh, both of us. We're going to be doing a, a, a double act for you today. So you'll uh, be hearing a bit of me from Andrew and back to me again and so forth. Um, but we're very grateful uh, for this opportunity to speak about uh, our recent book, uh, The Library of Fragile History, which uh, appeared uh, just last autumn. Now, this is really um, a subject um, close to our heart because as historians of, of early modern uh, printing and books, we spend a lot of our working life in libraries. And really you might say that they are, they provide the, sort of the lifeblood of our, of our research as, as storehouses of knowledge um, that's, you know, that, 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 that are home to books from 400 or 500, 600 years ago. And really um, working in all these libraries, ultimately we felt that there deserves to be a truly wide ranging accessible history of libraries, of the concept of library and the role that it has played in human society and indeed how that has evolved uh, through human society. Now, naturally, we are not uh, the very first people to write about uh, the his history of libraries. Um, we encountered in our research some absolutely fascinating um, literature written uh, mostly, I should say, by librarians who obviously as the custodians of their institutions know them from the inside out. Um, uh, but librarians have uh, the tendency to write in, in journal articles, the necessity of uh, a very busy working life. Um, and we wanted to do something slightly broader to pull all these stories together. And otherwise, if you look at the, the types of books that tend to be written about library history and library culture, uh, they tend to fall into two, uh, two genres or two camps. The first one is one uh, that celebrates libraries, in particular celebrates library architecture as, as these brilliant monuments of civilization. That's if you can look at the slide here, the uh, 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 library of Atmont Abbey in Austria, absolutely uh, glorious. But as you can also note, uh, very little room for reading. Indeed, books here are, are as much um, um, glorified wallpaper as, as much as something to be read. And if books don't fall into this camp, you know, that they uh, come see the hundred most uh, wonderful libraries in the world, they tend to fall in one like this, uh, the destruction of libraries, lamenting loss uh, of culture, um, of literary heritage, which although it is of course uh, an, an, an absolute um, uh, crime when libraries are targeted specifically to destroy cultures, um, we feel that there is actually a much more complex story of uh, the library that needs to be told. And really these two types of genres tend to be overemphasized because they resonate in so many ways with what people perceive to be a current crisis of the library. That digital changes, um, new technologies, 
uh, changes in the way that people uh, use books, read books, are leading to decline of libraries, decline of funding, and ultimately their collapse. Really, our book is an, is an antidote to this, uh, to this story. Uh, not because there isn't any decay and loss. Indeed, we've called our book The Library of Fragile History for a Reason. Um, and that is that decay and loss, the disintegration and dispersal of libraries, is really an inherent characteristic of library culture. It is part of a natural cycle of, of, um, of establishment, of growth and accumulation, of neglect, and then of decay. And it is not indeed uh, purposeful military destruction uh, that is at the heart of the uh, decline of libraries, but um, every, every, everyday neglect and the fact that every generation wishes to establish the library again in its own image. And that is really the story we're trying to tell in this book and that Andrew is going to tell you a bit more about now. Well, thanks, Arthur, and thank you all for your invitation. Uh, Philadelphia is one of my favorite cities in America, and I wish I could be there with you today, but perhaps another time. Well, what we're going to try and do is give you six talking points uh, that emerge from our work. And then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit at the end about the pleasures of co-authorship, since it's so vanishingly rare in the humanities. And the first of these talking points is the unexpected importance of private collecting to the library story which of course doesn't really feature in either of the models um, which Arthur has, um, has told you about. Uh, and this is the great revelation of the first book we wrote together on the book culture of the 17th century Dutch Republic. The scale of book collecting increased exponentially between the 15th century and the 17th with the invention of printing. In the manuscript era, a collection of 300 books would have been a royal collection. And a hundred years later, that was easy for a scholar or a doctor or, 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 or a lawyer to accumulate. And by the mid 17th century, a private collection of thousand books was routine. In fact, some professors had, professional, had personal collections three times the size of their institutional library. Can you believe that? Of course, virtually none of these private collections survive today. In fact, I would say, of all the libraries accumulated through history, less than one-tenth of one, uh, one percent survive today. But we can re reconstruct several thousand of these private uh, collections through a quintessentially Dutch innovation, the book auction. We've done an analysis of several hundred, uh, and we have a list of about half a million books registered in these collections. And in the process, we've disinterred a large number of editions documented in these records for which we can find no copy in any library today. So recovering lost books is a big part of our work now in St. Andrews. But this is important to all the way through library history. To give you just one example, uh, Milan Kundra's The Joke sold 119,000 copies after its publication in 1967 in uh, Czechoslovakia, but was then banned by the Communist Party after he'd been expelled from the party in, in 1930. So all the copies in public libraries were removed, but that still left 100,000 in private hands. And this is why all through history, private libraries have been far less easy for the government to control than public libraries. And I'm just going to tell you something about them now. Indeed, thank you, Andrew. Um, no, I mean, private libraries have been absolutely critical to, to the library story that, that we've written up here. Um, critical in every age, uh, every age of the library. But um, if you were to look at most previous accounts, you, you wouldn't find that because it's the public library that looms so large over overall um, uh, library history. And really, we, we believe that that is somewhat unjustly so. In part, that, that is for the reason that the public library, as we understand it and know it today, uh, as a, a government-funded institution that's welcoming, that's uh, free to all citizens to, um, to find recreation, to improve their lives, to just find a break uh, in their lives, that is actually a vanishingly small part of the greater uh, history of libraries. But if you just go by the, the, the use of the term public library or library for the public, you will find that these are already present in the, in the Roman Empire, 
where uh, great victorious generals or emperors might establish a library for communal purposes or for the commonwealth or for the public. Not because they wanted people to come to them and, and read books, but because this was meant as a magnanimous show of their, of their virtue and their worth and their contribution to the community. And most of the people who actually had access uh, would be uh, celebrated friends and, and uh, elite writers. And really, um, this continues throughout library history. It really speeds up. There's, there's many, many attempts to establish what we now know as public libraries after the invention of printing, when the, uh, the multipl multiplication of books in circulation allows people to gather these more easily and then say, OK, I know my family after my death doesn't, don't, don't want my books, but I want them to be of some use for, for the community afterwards. Um, so there's lots of attempts to establish uh, libraries and churches, uh, in, in town halls, uh, in abandoned monasteries, in all sorts of buildings uh, in, in, in most of Europe and indeed in the United States later as well. But these tend to um, be accompanied by a lot of fanfare upon immediate uh, opening and then very quickly to decline. Um, and in some ways, um, the history of the early public library has been, has been beguiled by the success of this great institution you see on the slide here the Bodleian Library in Oxford, um, newly uh, created in the early 17th century by Thomas Bodley to gift a new university library to, to Oxford. Um, this became a, a, a rampant success. Of course, it's still one of the finest uh, libraries uh, in the world today. But, and everyone has sort of seen this as a sign that, you know, uh, libraries are doing great in, in, in the 16th, 17th and 18th century. But it's, it's the opposite that's true. Uh, the Bodleian is really an exception because it had a, an acquisitions budget, it had a devoted librarian, it had a specific um, um, a home where it could be a specific purpose -built, purposely built building. It was open to readers almost every single day of its existence. Almost all these characteristics would not be present in any other uh, public library um, in the period. And it's really only with the rise of mass literacy and education in the 19th century where you get the development of a public library uh, movement, uh, first of all, specifically uh, in the UK and, in, and then in the United States as well. And, and here, the, the sort of the advent of campaigners for libraries, for free, for the people, is also um, not necessarily uh, something that, that went off to immediate su success. And uh, to give you one example, in 1850, um, the, the government in, in, the, in the United Kingdom passed the Public Libraries Act, which allowed communities to establish uh, public libraries in their own community uh, with the introduction of a, of a tax to pay for this. And very, very few communities actually took up this proposal. Not because people didn't like, didn't like books, didn't think they were good for them, but because they did not see the use of a communally funded library open for everyone. And public libraries really only took off at the end of the 19th century, uh, largely thanks to one great uh, uh, philanthropist, Andrew Carnegie uh, from Scotland. He used his industrial fortunes to establish thousands of libraries in the UK uh, and in the United States and some also elsewhere in the world. Uh, and largely because he, um, first of all, gave um, lots of money to the com these communities, gave them a sort of standard plan to enact but also because he tied them to actually pay for the upkeep and the continuation of the library, which was often the key thing. It's a sense of an endowment, a sense of legacy that was missing to so many of these ventures. So there we are. We have the uh, importance of private libraries, the short life of public libraries. And here is perhaps the most surprising of our conclusions, and that is this that modernity is a greater threat to libraries than fire, bombing, and deliberate destruction. Well, why, why is that? After all, the history of print is often written as a story of progress, the print revolution. And of course, in terms of access, there's a lot of truth to this, but print posed a real threat to existing library culture. In the first years, it undermined the great manuscript collections. Most of the lay collectors of books before the age of print printed largely for show, to show off wealth, to demonstrate their culture. And yet, if the 
Um, lawyer at the end of the road could have 300 books. There wasn't anything special left about their collection. So the uh, first century of print was actually a really difficult time for libraries, not least because in addition to this um, uh, sort of uh, sulking detachment of the uh, original library of manuscript collectors, we now have things like the Reformation. The Reformation produces a complete shift in the university curriculum. And with that, most of the, or I should say much of the learning of the medieval period is functionally redundant. Add to that the fact that Christendom is split in two, the circulation around the universities of texts and students is disrupted as universities are divided into uh, Protestant and Catholic portions with similar desperate uh, consequences for institutional libraries. Most university libraries have fewer than 4,000 books deep into the 18th century. And finally, the most unexpected of this is the cruel blow struck to libraries by the Enlightenment. This was a movement of the book, but only the right sort of books. The French revolutionaries and enlightened despots, the despots like uh, Joseph II, were keen to dispose of redundant, or in the case of revolutionary books, malignant learning. And that included for the revolutionaries, most religious books, which of course is the hugely uh, preponderant uh, class of books in public libraries. This resulted in the destruction of literally millions of books, many of them in France turned into cartridges for the revolutionary armies. This is in fact probably the biggest attack on library culture in history, proportional to the library stock of the period. But then it's much the same with private collections. No one wants their taste to be determined by their grandparents, which is why with each generation, the books of the past are slipped off to the auctioneers, or in our day, the secondhand bookshop, uh, leaving you to collect anew yourself. So that's the dangers of modernity. Indeed. Now, I just want to take you to one of the other key themes um, of our book, and that's really the, the, the idea that we are now very much living in an age of, of multimedia libraries. Uh, the, the public library uh, doesn't just uh, grant you physical books. It, it is a, a home for public services, um, for education, for meeting groups. Uh, people can go there to access the Internet. It is in many ways, uh, in, in many of, the, of the, the places that we have also visited, uh, the library is really at the heart of a, of a community. And one of the things that we try to explain in our book is in, is in fact that libraries have had a very long social history and also one in which they've constantly evolved into lots of different forms rather than just there being one or two models of the library. And one of the best examples of this is the rise in the 18th century of the, of the subscription library. Uh, indeed, the very first one, famously, of course, uh, established in, in Philadelphia. Um, where really, and this rapidly expanded in um, the rest of the uh, uh, United States and, and all throughout all of Europe and, uh, and European colonies as well, the idea that a, a group of like-minded people uh, club together their finances to acquire books that they then own in communal ownership so that they can all have access to, uh, to it, even with modest funds. Now, this was hugely successful uh, because it also crucially allowed uh, people to get many different subscriptions to uh, a really important expanding range of print, newspapers, journals, periodicals, that would be extremely expensive to have personal subscriptions to a wide range. So subscription libraries um, really became uh, meeting clubs as well, social spaces where people could, could meet and discuss and talk in a, um, in a, sort of, in a safe space, if you'd like, um, where they knew they could find people with relatively um, uh, similar opinions, but still uh, possibly of, of, different, um, of different spots. And this sort of subscription model also uh, transcended um, in, into, and, and emerged into other, other forms. We know, for example, of libraries attached to, uh, of course, the political parties. Um, uh, you had the famous mechanics libraries intended for, for working men, uh, especially for immigrant working men trying to find uh, a new home in a, in, in a, new, uh, a new country or city. Uh, you had miners' libraries. Um, but then, of course, we have um, a very different forms too. Um, to give you one example from our very recent age, 
this is the uh, Orkney mobile um, uh, library uh, that travels around the, uh, the Isles of Orkney uh, of Scotland, uh, delivering books to people whenever they need them. And this sort of uh, mobile library is, is found all throughout the world in all its various forms, whether it's on boats, uh, on donkeys, uh, on horses, on handcarts, you name it. And again, I think this type of library really um, pays tribute to a very social act of sharing books with people uh, that uh, is, is so crucial to, to the enjoyment of libraries for so many. And if we think of the way that library, public libraries are evolving today, uh, especially in France with their famous uh, mediatheques, um, they are really, they're not just breaking new ground, but they're also embracing a much older model, that of the, of the Renaissance library, where libraries were much more about a social space um, than just as a, a sort of monastic cell of quiet contemplation. And I think what our, our modern libraries get right is that they are able to offer a sense of both of these, both being welcoming and offering a space for quiet reflection. Well, I want to make one last uh, intervention here, and that's to talk about the importance of bookshops to the library story. Um, we, um, uh, I asked Arthur to leave out of his list of different types of libraries, circulating libraries, which first uh, come our way in the uh, 18th century. And, and these are people, uh, places where people either have an annual subscription or they can take out books one by one. And the point about these is that whereas in the 19th century in particular, the uh, public libraries were trying to direct you to um, uh, improving books, these circulating libraries allowed you to take out the books you wanted. And you can see on this slightly satirical um, illustration, the two um, shelves with novels and romances have been swept bare whereas there's plenty of sermons still left for anyone who fancies one. But the other threat to the public library movement we haven't touched upon is the paperback. Um, the paperback introduced in the middle of the, the 20th century, which was in many ways the great age of the library, was very, very difficult for public libraries because instead of having to wait in a queue to get the book you wanted, you could just go to a shop and buy the paperback for less than 10% of the cost of the hardback books to which public libraries were, um, were dedicated because these books um, couldn't do with uh, being lent out to multiple users. So it was a real problem for the public library movement. And then of course, they now have to compete with so many other calls on our attention. As we're in the 21st century, what you find is that many more people say they believe in public libraries than actually use them. Um, and the, the result is that very often people use a bookshop as their public library because the importance of a public library is browsing. Uh, the importance of any library used to be that you could run your eye down the shelves and see not only the book you thought you wanted, but a book you'd never heard of. In public libraries now, they have so many other functions that the amount of space they have for books on open shelves is much reduced. Whereas in St. Andrews, for instance, our public library has about 2000 books available. Most university people don't use it because we have our university library, but the independent bookstore has um, as many as 30,000 books. So the browsing function that was once the purpose of libraries is now converted to bookshops. And perhaps they have, like in the days of the circulating libraries, many of which were attached to bookshop, perhaps bookshops have a continuing part to play in the library history. But I see that is our 20 minutes. So I will hand back to our chair in case you have any questions. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. And we do have questions. And I will turn to the first one <clears throat> from Paul Friedman, who says, thank you for emphasizing the role of enlightened modernity in the destruction of books and libraries. In my work on medieval Spain, I've been struck by the role of, rev of revolutionary destruction of sources that too place in the 19th and 
20th, early 20th centuries. Do you think some of the surprise you mentioned is because the good guys, that is progressive anti-ecclesiastical advocates undertook the campaigns? Yeah, I think that's I think that's that's certainly the case, and and thank you for mentioning that because um, this is a sort of enlightened uh, modern uh, destruction. is it happens in different countries at different times. So in France, it's really the the revolution uh, that sees its most destruction, but in Italy and in in Spain and Portugal, uh, it tends to take place a bit later with the uh, dissolution of of many monasteries. Um, yes, what, what what can one say? I I think you know every every gener every society. Uh, at a point in time, tends to uh, view itself as the most enlightened one, I think, um, and has a sense that the books that they produce uh, are, in fact, the best books and, you know, that they deserve a place on the shelf. And I like to think these days many, uh, you know, we, we, we are a bit more careful with what we uh, throw away, but we're producing immense amounts of information, so many different media now, that I think we're not uh, uh, preserving very well at all. Uh, especially, of course, so much communication and, and publishing that's now taking place in a digital form. Um, in a hundred years' time, we're going to be faced with a, a big challenge and probably have future historians talking about us saying, look how careless they were. So it is a double-edged sword. <clears throat> so question from Frank Stewart. Have you looked at non-Western libraries? As you mentioned, in late medieval Europe, a private library with as many as 300 books would have been something exceptional and not within the means of an ordinary scholar. But in the medieval Muslim world, it was otherwise. We have a detailed account of the library of a 13th century Baghdadi scholar, not an exceptionally rich or prominent man, and it contained roughly 1,500 separate titles. Public libraries and the libraries of politically prominent figures in Baghdad at the time were much larger. Most were destroyed in the Mongol invasion. So his question is, uh, do you have any comments on, on non-Western libraries? Oh, well, thanks very much. It's a very good question. And we um, deal with these questions insofar as the historical record allows. Um, the um, non-Western libraries play a large part in the story of manuscripts uh, and of manuscript libraries before the invention of print. But the invention of print is a real parting of the ways. Um, largely because it's only um, Europe which finds the diversity of readers necessary, necessary to sustain a commercial print market. And that means that whereas the manuscript age goes on much later in many of the non-Western parts of the world, the sheer volume produced with, of books um, up to the end of the 17th century um, I think you can talk of something in the region of a billion items being put into the market by print. This is what allows the development of a multi-stratified um, book world and, a, um, and uh, the um, development of so many private libraries. Now, that simply doesn't happen in the non-Western world, and that's the limitation uh, that is placed on us until, of course, print is introduced to those places, um, partly by the um, imperial powers um, in the 19th century. Thank you. And that has to be our last question. Thank you, gentlemen, very much.